What are the best smartphones in the world right now? It's a big question, but uh, today we've got some answers. I've got five honorable mentions, phones that didn't quite make the top tier, and then 13 phones that I absolutely love. And number five in this list of runners up is the new iPhone SE. To be clear, I like almost everything about it. It's got the build quality and the performance of a thousand dollar phone, and it's 399. Even the camera is really quite good. It's just that the battery life isn't. And it's not just a case that battery isn't the strong point of the phone. It's more that, you know, it could actually cause you a bit of a problem. And if you're going to use your phone for two to three years, it's only going to get worse over that period. So if you're considering the SE, I personally think there's better options, but we'll come to them. Number four is a phone that looks pretty unremarkable on paper. You could read through the phone's entire spec sheet and not a single thing would jump out at you as, wow, that's really cool. But the Google Pixel 3a is one of the nicest phones to use for the $300 you can get it at now. Clean Google software with a pretty decent OLED screen. But with this phone, Google has kind of shifted the balance for what they think is important in a phone, away from really high-end materials. This thing's made of plastic and away from a screen that fills the entire front of the phone. For this, the camera. I was just messing around with it a few weeks ago, taking photos of my cat. And it's so impressive that I came back wondering if even my $1,400 Galaxy S20 Ultra could have done this. The reason it's only an honorable mention is because this is their mid-range phone from last year and is soon to be replaced by the Google Pixel 4a. So if you bought it now, you might be a little bummed in a couple of months. But that brings me to the Pixel 4, which is the company's top end flagship from last year. And it might be a bit of a surprise I'm even mentioning this at all, because when it launched for $800, it was underwhelming and the whole thing was undercut by poor battery life. If a phone can't get through a full day of usage, then as far as I'm concerned, it could have the coolest features on the planet. It could tie your shoelaces for you, but I can't recommend it. However, However, in a bit of a surprise turn of events, after a few updates, Pixel 4 battery life improved in my testing. That doesn't happen very often, to be clear. And add to that that in most regions you can now get the Pixel 4 for like $499, and I think it's actually quite a viable alternative to the iPhone SE. Number two is a bit of a sad story. We're talking a smartphone that has an incredible set of cameras, really, really good performance, and a market-leading display. This is the Oppo Find X2 Pro, and under different circumstances, this could well have been a smartphone of the year. The catch is that it's been pretty much invalidated by the existence of the OnePlus 8 Pro. Barely a month after the Find X2 Pro, OnePlus dropped a phone with almost identical specs, similar design, and a software skin I think most people will prefer, and a much lower price tag. And that turns this Oppo phone into basically a luxury alternative to the OnePlus. This phone has a beautiful vegan leather finish. I want more companies to do this. It feels like a supercar. The cameras, they can zoom further, but from a practical standpoint, I just don't think it's worth the extra money. And then the final runner-up is also from Oppo, is the Renault 3 Pro. I used this phone for like two whole months this year, which is far longer than I usually use mid-range phones. You could think of this as a nearly flagship camera stuck on a mid-range phone's body. I just would have liked to see a higher end chipset inside of it. Okay, those are the good smartphones, and that leaves us with the best smartphones. And I've categorized them for the different kinds of buyer with one overall champion at the end. So first of all, if you're anything like me and you're almost a little bit sick of smartphones overtaking the size of your face, you just want a compact flagship, there are three good options. Just as a disclaimer, I say the word compact in a fairly loose sense of the word, because most good phones now are not small phones, but these three should be pretty manageable for all hands. So first of all, Galaxy S20. And this is pretty much the compact phone I've been asking for for years. It's got the latest everything, fastest chipset, RAM, storage, the camera. This is quintessential Samsung. And the screen is in the top five displays on a phone right now. We're talking Quad HD plus AMOLED 120 Hertz panel. And the battery's great if you get the Snapdragon version. And that's the one caveat. If you're in a region like the UK or India, where Samsung serves the Exynos version, battery life falls from great to pretty good. Alternatively, iPhone 11 Pro. And I mean, I could sit here comparing the specs and the features, but this really boils down to the question, do you want an iPhone or do you want an Android? If you're open to either, I would say try the Galaxy S20. It's got 5G and the 120 Hertz display will make it feel faster. But rest assured, if you go for the iPhone 11 Pro, it's up there too. And finally, the last compact phone is actually the Galaxy S10e. Now, I generally try to stay away from recommending older phones because they're just gonna become outdated faster. But because this category of compact flagship phones doesn't get too much love, this is still one of the better options for now closer to $500. Good 
good camera, great screen, and this just feels like it was made for your palm. Incredibly comfortable to hold. Okay, gaming phones. And to be honest, there's two that win by an absolute landslide. The first one is the Red Magic 5. G, which is surprisingly affordable and quite possibly the fastest smartphone on the planet. It's also got a 144Hz display, that's the kind of refresh rate you see on high-end PC gaming monitors, and just generally a bucket load of features for gamers, but I've made a more in-depth video about this phone already, so I'll link it somewhere here. So the second of these gaming phones is Xiaomi's Black Shark 3 Pro. Somehow, even more outlandish. We're talking a 7.1 inch Quad HD Plus 90 Hertz AMOLED display, a phone with a 5,000 mAh battery, a 65 watt charger, and dedicated trigger buttons that hide themselves when they're not in use. I remember when I first found out about the existence of this phone, and it took me a grand total of a minute to scrap the video I was currently working on and focus all my efforts on getting this and reviewing it. And I can confirm it's a pleasure to use as well, providing, you know, it fits in your hand. But at this point, I should clarify that technically any of these flagship phones can play games just fine. Buying a gaming phone is for people who are happy to take a bit of a hit in the camera department, for starters, and B, people who play games either competitively or just for long periods of time. Otherwise, you might not even see the benefits at all. You'll just be that person who holds a TV to their ear to make a phone call. I've had a few people ask me, should I save a bit of money and buy an older gaming phone? Like, let's say the Asus ROG Phone 2. And the answer is probably not. The way I see it, if you want to game seriously on your phone, the number one priority is having the best performance. So if you're picking up a gaming phone from last year that has an older chip, then all of those optimizations you're paying for, like liquid cooling or a physical fan inside, they're a bit redundant. You'd get better performance if you bought just the cheapest current phone with the latest chip even if it didn't have all those things. But okay, my main problem with gaming phones, the reason I don't use one is that they tend to sacrifice on photography. But if you did want to take great photos, if for you, your smartphone is just as much about its camera as it is about connecting you with people, then the Huawei P40 Pro is the best photography experience I've had on a phone. As long as you're okay with the fact that there are no Google services pre-built on this phone, if for example, you're perfectly happy with Huawei's own app gallery, or if you're a bit of a tinkerer and you wanted to try and sideload Google, then this is an awesome bit of hardware with good battery life too. But I mean, you can get good battery life from any of these phones I've put on my top list. But what if you wanted great? What if you wanted to wake up in the morning, download 10 movies, spend the entire day watching them, and then finish that all off with a session of gaming? Well, there's two great options, iPhone 11 Pro Max and Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. Again though, Snapdragon version. They're both seriously expensive and just big phones, but as far as phones with massive batteries are concerned, they're still two of the more balanced offerings. Let me be clear, you can get phones with bigger batteries than these two, but a good smartphone experience is all about balance. What you don't want is a mediocre smartphone with a power bank taped to its back. On the subject of iPhones though, and I thought long and hard about whether or not I should include this, but I decided it's important to have an affordable iPhone category. And this sounds like a pretty strange idea, but here's the thing. If there was one undisputable smartphone king at each price point, my job would be pretty easy. All I'd need to do is to just find out how much someone was willing to pay, and then be like, okay, this is the best phone you can get with that. But people have different preferences, things that for them are base requirements in a phone that they choose. And the one I see the most is, I need it to be an iPhone. I have a lot of people I know personally who don't ask which phone should I buy, they ask which iPhone should I buy? Because they want Apple features like FaceTime and iMessage, etc. So if you're in that group and you don't have the budget to buy the absolute top end iPhone 11 Pro, then you're probably picking between three options. The $399 iPhone SE, the $599 10R, and the $699 iPhone 11. Long story short, I'm gonna make this easy for you. Pick the 11. The SE is probably not gonna cut it battery wise and compared to the 10R, the 11 is far faster and has a much better camera system. If you're on a budget just generally and you don't need an iPhone, then I would say Realme 6. For those of you who don't know, Realme is yet another subsidiary of BBK Electronics, like Oppo, like Vivo, like OnePlus. But the difference is that Realme is new, and because it's new, the company's trying to make a name for itself, and to do that, they're pricing their phones at a staggeringly affordable price. So for around $250, this one has, first of all, a quad camera setup that would sit fine on a $400 phone, a 1080p display, which somehow also has a 90Hz refresh rate, an upper mid-range chipset specializing in gaming, and great battery life. Don't get me wrong, you'll know when you're using it that it's not a top-level flagship, but for this price, it's not even 
close. Realme 6 is up there. There's also the Poco X2, really just nice phone. And again, for a budget-friendly price. We're talking 120 hertz display. We're talking 4,500 milliamp hour battery. It's just that you'll struggle to buy this phone outside of India. So I haven't officially added it to the list. Okay, before the overall winner, let's talk about the best all-rounder phones. Phones that don't necessarily specialize in one thing, but ones that do everything well. And there's a few here. I already mentioned the iPhone 11 Pro and Galaxy S20 Ultra. These two, they nail the fundamental pillars of what makes a good smartphone. But there's three more. Galaxy S20 Plus, which is really similar to the Ultra in the things that matter, but just slightly smaller, a bit more manageable, and more affordable. And to be honest, even though, yeah, the 64 megapixel main camera there should be less capable than the 108 megapixel one on the Ultra, in practice, it's not, really. There are cases where the Ultra looks better, but there are plenty of cases where the normal S20 and S20 Plus look better, but the fact that they trade blows is telling. We then got Xiaomi's Mi 10 Pro, and as far as I'm aware, this is the most expensive mainstream phone they've ever made. And for some context, the Mi 9 Pro last year was like $600. This is a thousand, but for that you get pretty much just insane specs across the board. So to give you an idea, you've got Snapdragon 865, a 108 megapixel quad camera setup, you've got a 4,500 milliamp hour battery with an insane 65 watt charger included in the box, 5G, dual speakers, everything. Plus, it's all wrapped in something I really appreciate on phones, a soft touch matte finish. It does miss out on an official IP rating, which is kind of confusing considering the massive price hike over last generation, but I don't think that alone should stop you considering this phone. And then finally in this category is OnePlus 8 Pro. And apart from having a headphone jack, this is 100% an everything phone. Every feature that you think a 2020 flagship should have, this probably does. And it does so cheaper than its competitors. You could put it side by side with the S20 Ultra as an example, and some people might actually say they prefer the OnePlus, even though it's $400 less. But it's not the ultimate value king. And people have also asked me about the Galaxy Note 10 Plus from last year as a potential current best all-rounder. But personally, I would err on the side of caution with that one. I just think the cameras and the power of the S20 lineup, they've come a long way, but the Note 10 Plus still isn't old enough to be cheap either. Okay, that leaves me with my current smartphone of the year. And just before I get to that, there's a couple of phones that I've been seeing online that look really interesting that I haven't managed to test yet. There's the Xperia 1 2, which is this super widescreen cinematography focused phone. And it supposedly uses technology from the company's own alpha DSLR cameras. I think this is an awesome concept, but just bear in mind, it doesn't mean it's gonna be great. Just take the Red Hydrogen 1 as an example. <laughs> There's this funky new LG Velvet smartphone, which kind of makes it seem like LG has gone right back to the drawing board in terms of design. I'd say it looks decent. I think it's meant to be inspired by water drops, but what's confusing to me is that this would have been a perfect chance to start using a hole punch camera for the front, as opposed to this kind of ugly looking notch. And then finally is Motorola's Edge Plus, which is yet another thousand dollar flagship phone, but one that looks like it has very little missing. It's even got a 5,000 milliamp hour battery and a headphone jack. So if the software's good, this could actually be top level. And now my overall smartphone value champion is a phone that I was expecting to be impressed by. And I was. It's the OnePlus 8, but with one important asterisk, which I'll come to. The phone has OnePlus's typical caveats. It loses wireless charging and an official water resistance rating. But the important thing is that using it feels indistinguishable from the very best phones out there. And top level chipset, top level display. This the most comfortable phone I've held in a long time. It feels just as premium as the $1,000 Huawei P40 Pro and Xiaomi Mi 10 Pro, but actually has sleeker, less bloated software than both of those offerings. The one area you'll be reminded that you didn't just sink $1,000 into your phone is the camera, where OnePlus has basically reused the sensors from last year's flagships. I was initially kind of annoyed by this, but I mean, look at the iPhone SE that uses a camera sensor from three years ago, just with improved software. And it's a similar story here. The camera won't blow you away but it's actually quite good. The asterisk. The important thing to bear in mind here is that with OnePlus phones in particular, pricing varies massively by region, to the point where I don't think it's even fair for me to say that the OnePlus 8 is the best value regardless of where you are. Let me give you an example. In the US, OnePlus 8 is the exact same price as the iPhone 11, but here in the UK, it's the equivalent of $130 cheaper. And if you go to India, it is literally $300 cheaper. So while in the US, you could look at both of these phones and think, okay, I've got a slight preference for iOS, 
I'm gonna pick the iPhone. That makes much less sense in the UK, and it makes much, much less sense if you were in India, where I think the OnePlus delivers unquestionably higher value. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, do consider subscribing, that would be incredible. With that being said, my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.